Hey there, welcome to today's episode of Forward Thinking. We have two guests today. Um, we have Grant Gregorian and Courtney McGara, and um, they actually uh, lead a podcast for marketing technology consultants. And we were a recent guest on their podcast. Um, both of them very seasoned MOPS professionals, and we thought it'd be great to have them on to talk about you know, everything in MOPS consulting, um, what it's like to kind of enter that new world and go solo and um, take in a lot of the advice that they've gotten from their interviews so far. And maybe also talk about other things mm -hmm. <laughs> regarding MOPS, just because, you know, once you get four MOPS pros on a podcast, you're probably going to go in different directions. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, welcome, um, Grant and Courtney. Maybe you could just intro yourselves and uh, just a tiny bit about your background um, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead, Courtney. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Um, as you said, my name is Courtney Makara. I've been working in kind of SaaS automation tech since about 2008 and kind of just ended in, in a company that had Salesforce that I'd never learned, heard of before and learned it and worked my way into the marketing departments and ended up kind of moving my career into the land of Marketo and marketing automation. Um, and then in 2019, left my full-time in-house employee role and decided to open the doors to Mustang Martech, which is my independent consulting gig. Um, and along those, those paths and journeys, I think Grant and I met in probably like, I don't know, 2015 timeframe. Uh, Grant, you can kind of give your background. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, you guys, for having us. So fun. It's a meta, meta podcast. <laughs> event. And um, <laughs> yes, so my background is I've been doing mops and kind of operations analytics for B2B marketing companies for maybe like 10 years now. And um, in-house, outhouse, um, I, uh, and also on a vendor side, I started my own company and um, as a, for in, in the same industry. But most recently, I've been quite like Courtney, uh, went solo the last year doing uh, consulting practice focused on B2B marketing analytics mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, really enjoyed it. And so that's why when, I, you know, when Courtney and I were talking, we're both kind of solo practitioners, both thinking about, you know, how does this work? What's the right thing to do? How do you acquire customers? Should you build a team? You know, I think uh, I might, my practice is up to four people or so now. Um, so I definitely went the, the mini agency route rather than keep keep it solo. In any case, there's lots of things to think about. You know, how do you hire? How do you build a team? How do you do your taxes? And so we uh, decided that the best way to learn was to talk to other people and uh, other consultants, other practitioners, um, agency owners. And um, what better way to get them to talk to you is then to host a podcast. Uh, so we started a podcast and the, and, the, and the focus of our podcast is not about mops, like, you know, how to make your Salesforce sync to Marketo. It's more about the career of mops. You know, how do you progress in your career? How do you require, acquire more responsibility? And, and um, how do you go solo? If you want to go solo as a consultant, how do you join an agency? Uh, what, what, what that is like um, just from... Um, uh, like your jobs and the career point of view. So, um, yeah. So check us out. Awesome. Yeah, we're we're excited to um, just also take on a lot of those learnings. I think for for anyone making that leap to go solo or for mops, that we there tends to be a really strong community behind it. Everyone sharing advice and. Um, cause a lot of times you're maybe a team of one. And then if you're going solo, you're definitely a team of one. So <laughs> being able to lean on the people around you and get some advice, um, can be great. So you don't have to just, you know, stumble along, along the way. Um, so yeah, I think that's awesome that you shared, you know, why you started the podcast. I think it's, it, that's a great, you know, idea to have, on how to kind of get all of that advice. Definitely share and then share it with everyone, which is amazing. Um, after doing those um, interviews, you've done 20 so far and you're continuing to do more and more each week. 
Um, you know, what's something surprising that you found during those interviews or what's one of the things, cause you guys probably have been doing this a while and you're like, oh, we, you know, we kind of know what maybe people might have encountered or, or said, but what's something that really surprised you? Let me go first. I'll go first again. Yeah. Um, I think something that surprised me that actually really warmed my heart was that imposter syndrome is everywhere. Um, I felt like a fraud that I was like, yeah, I'm going to go independent and do my own thing. And I got business cards and a website, but deep down I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> I was very mm -hmm. nervous and I thought I can't let people know that I'm nervous. No clients are going to want to hire me if I'm nervous, but talking to other people who had been freelancing and consulting for years before me also admitted to being nervous and it's, it's okay. And um, once you kind of dig into why you're nervous and um, you kind of uncover that, it's kind of a bonding experiment. And then once you start talking about, well, are you nervous about the work? Are you nervous about building a life cycle model or an engagement program or fi fixing, you know, a uh, hidden field on a form? No, those things don't make me nervous, but it was the other stuff that made me nervous and that's okay. So that was kind of um, really so, nice and kind of surprise. Yeah. So what was some of the stuff that people were getting nervous about and giving them imposter syndrome was there a common thread um i think it is just like landing the deal you have to become your own sdr and ae and salesperson and like how do you talk about yourself in that way you know we're all used to in an in-house role you have a manager and you set up your okrs for the quarter for the year but when you're actually trying to pitch yourself and put a dollar amount to the work you know, a gross net income dollar amount to the work to some VP of, you know, marketing or rev ops um, that got a little bit nerve wracking and people are like, well, how do I scope it out? I don't know how many hours it's going to take me to mm -hmm. redo something because, you know, generally when you're working for a company, they're like, they just own you for 40 hours a week. And if they're saying, well, we want you to do four engagement programs with 17 different segments, but you have 20 hours to do it. And then how do you figure that out. I think that's the the unknown is what people get really nervous about. Yeah. Yeah. And then you raise a good point about once you do go on your own, you are all of those supporting functions, right? Your sales, your customer success, your HR, like it, and then you're doing all of these things that you haven't had to really do before, which adds to the imposter syndrome. You're having to put yourself out there maybe more than when you're in-house and you're kind of just being told what to do a bit more and you have direction it's like kind of all on you once you're by yourself. You've got to figure out your direction. You've got to figure out your path. And yeah, that's just ripe for creating imposter syndrome. Um, did you notice anything? So I think imposter syndrome is a, a, a great topic. Did you notice anything um, when with different groups of people you've spoken to? Because you've spoken to people across the board, right? You've spoken to the, the solo practitioner, to people who work for big agencies. Is, is there any, any differences that you explored there? Because my experience is that Imposter syndrome sometimes even gets worse as people kind of get bigger, right? Or like their their role or their their company gets bigger. But did you experience kind of the same thing? Or yeah, I think you, you you hit the nail on the head there. It's almost like the more experience you have, or someone hears, oh, they've been doing mops for ten years, they must know everything there is to know <laughs> about APIs and webhooks and data lakes and stuff. And then the imposter syndrome really creeps in. Um, and so I think we've all just realized the best thing to do is admit what you do know and don't know, and maybe not under promise, but, you know, promise what you are confident with and don't make mm -hmm. some over promise guarantee because again, your name is on the line. Yeah. That's really good advice. And Grant, were you going to bring out something that you found surprising or were you going to echo kind of what Connie <clears throat> was talking about there? Well, I mean, the thing that surprised me after talking to um, a lot of the consulting folks and in-house folks was just how many people were moonlighting on the side of mm. their full-time jobs. I was like, "You what? You work? You know, like, I didn't know that. I've known you guys for years, and I didn't know that you have a full-time job, but you're also consulting. So for, for a lot of people, um, they do have these little side projects where they're working uh, weekends or nights, um, sometimes within, you know, it's not like their uh, side projects are, you know, building model trains. It's like, it's mops. They're also doing mm -hmm. their, <laughs> you know, full-time, but for slightly maybe smaller company or something where they get to explore uh, what it's like to be a consultant. They get to explore like smaller projects and they get a little side business, you know, kind of going. And so they're able to somehow separate the two and they, are way busier than I am, I guess. Um, but 
that was uh, what surprised me um, was just, I didn't realize it was so uh, commonplace, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think part of that is, um, and I think we, we experienced this where it doesn't feel like there's, it, it's a competitive, like between consultants, it doesn't feel like there's a real compet. Maybe like the the really big agencies, I'm sure there's like a competitive thing going on there. But um, outside of that, it feels like there's just enough work to go around, um, and then some. Which is why probably there's so many opportunities for people to moonlight and start their own thing, and and then that probably hopefully should give people confidence to do it and not feel. Maybe there's a bit of a, maybe that could help with imposter syndrome, even just knowing the opportunity and knowing how in demand their skill set is, um, because there's you know a lot of work out there and maybe not as many people who know how to do that work. So it's always mm -hmm. in demand. And hopefully, you know, I don't jinx that and the whole world changes tomorrow. But. <laughs> no, no, I think I think a big thing also is what a lot of especially you know younger uh, in, in, in their early in their career, folks don't realize is just how many flavors of type of work there right. is out there. You know, there's mm -hmm. the moonlighting, but for what kind of company? Are you a consultant in an agency? But even then, are you like consultant, essentially full-time working at one company for one project? Or are you dispersed amongst many projects? Or, you know, we talked to, we talked to a guy who was a consultant at an agency, but he effectively worked at a different company for like for years and so mm. his colleagues didn't even know that he was an, you know an imposter he was uh he wasn't actually an employee of the company he was a he was a full-time contractor and so he went to all the all the beers you know all the happy hours together mm -hmm. back when that was allowed and uh, so he really felt like the part of a two teams at the same time and there's that kind of consulting and there's just so many different kinds and and a lot of and not everyone gets to experience and see all the different kinds because it's, you know, how many different really jobs do you get to do in your life? You know, so mm -hmm. you have. And so uh, through the through these conversations and podcasts, we want we kind of want to illuminate all the different experiences that people are having and all the different variations in which they're able to work. Yeah. And that, and that there's also the variation in the type of work, right? Like, Grant, mm -hmm. you're more on the analytics side yeah. and there's like kind of the the demand gen side and then there's the op side then, then there's platform specific mm -hmm. people have did you when you're speaking to people getting into it and getting their experiences did how, did you get much into positioning early on like how they would position how they would think about kind of their breadth of services and obviously keeping it within their own expertise but sometimes trying to push themselves in certain areas did you dive into those topics yeah we've talked about this a little bit um we talk a lot about like, how do you find clients and how do you say that what it is that you do? The story that I like to tell is um, what happened to me when I first went solo um, is I remember I was unhappy for some reason. I, I, I was like stressed out and I was working really hard. I felt like and I, I felt like I didn't, wasn't getting enough money. And then I was like, there's no one to blame. I don't have a boss. <laughs> I don't have, I can't like say, oh, so-and-so is always on. It was me, you know? and um, and when I realized that I, I really did have the freedom to to define what it is that I do and for whom and how, um, it was it was empowering, um, but also it, you know it, it it gave me it gave me so much more freedom to to experiment and to try different things when I when I talk to folks. Um, one of the lessons I think from the podcast was in positioning. Uh, there is kind of a counterintuitive thing that happens. Your gut reaction is to say, yeah, I can do that because mm -hmm. you want to get the sale. Yeah, I can do that. And or that other thing, you know, we can do that too, mm -hmm. you know, and I can do, and so you try to, to and so you get this like, um, you know, list of services that are all over the place. And I found that it's the opposite. It's, and, and then you don't get the sale and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. But I said I could do everything. And, um, but on the other hand, when you specialize, even further than you think you know i only do you know email analytics for b2b b2c companies that are in the food space and i optimize their subject lines that's all i do or you know something like that you're gonna get hits you know all the time because if somebody's looking for that person you're the consultant who is the best in the world at that one little thing and uh and you might get way more business out of it than if you were um everything for everyone hmm. yeah absolutely yeah we've we've thought about that a lot and it because 
especially in what we do all, all in marketing operations there's so much that you can do yeah. and then obviously it's marketing too so you end up also knowing a lot about demand gen and field marketing and other parts of marketing that aren't even really part of the operational side that that when you so we have this a lot happen a lot our clients bring us on for marketing ops related stuff then we kind of grow within that client and we end up doing more than just marketing operations but like we would we, we don't often take on a new client for those that type of extended service it's like once we have the relationship mm -hmm. we sometimes expand but um but yeah so our, our positioning we try and keep it t as tight as possible to make sure that right you 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 resonate as much as you can with the, with that audience that you know you can target well mm -hmm. um but then if you do have a client and it is something that you can do i don't see it as a problem to like take it on a little bit no. but you're right like don't you don't want to overextend yourself and we did we've had that with issues with that like way early on like mm -hmm. about five years ago we started trying to do everything like we, we ended up web getting a contractor on web development and we had like all of these different aspects and it was just too difficult for us to manage like, personally you know i know bigger agencies can handle that but we were still kind of in the smaller kind of independent agency mindsets like all the work was coming to us too mm -hmm. but we still had like these other services that we weren't really the true expert in and that's where we ended up tripping ourselves up and having to you know, shrink our uh, services down and really tighten our positioning and that's when since we did that then our business has been much more successful easier to manage less stressful um and all of the above so yeah and I think for anyone listening too I think it's okay I, I I think you have to realize like things will evolve like if you don't have your specific talk track like from day one I think it doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful in what you do or even building an agency like if it means just putting yourself out there to your network and seeing like if there's people that want to work with you and that's going to give you the confidence to, you know, score those accounts and build up your agency. That's fine. That's even kind of what, you know, we did. And, but after a certain point, you need to realize like, as you work with those clients and you really like understand where are your sweet spots, like what are the different projects that you, you know, like, mm -hmm you really see value in and always position yourself towards those projects that you see that your prospects see value in, then you can start to formulate that talk track and it'll make it easy to feel confident in charging what you do for it. I think Courtney mentioned something about imposter syndrome coming that down to the sale. And I, I think across the board, men and women, you know, really struggle to talk about money, but I even find that women even struggle even more. Um, and I, I think for any women consultants too, like just getting that confidence to really position yourself to the value, knowing your value will make having those conversations so much easier and to be firm, like don't, you know, to be able to, um, feel confident so you don't get, you know, negotiated out or, or feel like you can, you know, make some things slide or, you know, so, um, but yeah, for anyone listening, like it doesn't need to be day one, everyone's path's different, but I love your advice of, you know, really trying to nail down those specifics. So, um, I, I'd love to know, so when, from the 20 people you've interviewed, did you find there was a common path? Did you, would, would most people you've interviewed start moonlighting, then go solo, then maybe if they did grow, like take on a few? Or did people, did how many, what was the percentage of just jumping solo versus moonlighting first and dipping the toe in the water? Grant, you're Mr. Analytics. Have you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, do you want to share the screen? <laughs> yeah, I've actually thought about this. Um, there is no common path, okay. um, for sure. I can tell you that uh, without having to actually look at the numbers. Um, it's all over the place, really. Everyone has their own um, journey here. Mm -hmm. So, some people start in house. I mean, especially with MOPS and like marketing technology, uh, people are starting as designers and then, you know, kind of more art school sort of background. Um, they're, they're thinking of marketing in those terms um, in terms of like branding and things like that. And then they end up in Photoshop and then now they're designing emails and all of a sudden the email needs the logic and oh my gosh, I'm in Marketo and I get sucked <laughs> in and I'm in MOPS. <laughs> and then there's people who are coming from um more like communication writing 
uh, copy background. I mean, all over the place. And, um, and then jumping from agencies to in-house to, so um, the only pattern is that it's a mess. Everyone is just <laughs> jumping all over the place. And very rarely do people stay in one, one uh, place for a long time. Yeah. yeah do, do you I see agree. the value? I also, I'm going to chime in and say, I thought it would be really hard for us to find what we call the trifecta, someone that's done all three, you know, in-house, mm -hmm. independent, and agency. And I think we've talked to like three people that have the yep. trifecta. Um, and that's not to say that any of those situations are bad, but um, pe some people liked the agency because they like the support, but they miss owning, you know, one instance and seeing things really, you know, mm -hmm. follow through. And some people like the variety. And it was just kind of really, I think, again, uh, reassuring that you just have to figure out what works best for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think you you will know until you try, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and I do think there is a real benefit to doing, um, like when you go, when you work at a specific company, you're mm -hmm. in-house, you go really deep on the mm -hmm. problem, which makes you, over time, a really good candidate to be a great consultant. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you'll be able to empathize and understand the difficulties that your clients yeah. are having. So then totally. you're, it's like a, you know, then you become a consultant and then you see all the different clients and you're empathizing with all of them and you're, you, you feel them, but then you start over time to lose the sense of depth and the sense of, and so then you become a really, really great candidate. But now you've seen so many, the way so many different people are working and you have this like broad view of the industry which makes you a really great candidate to go in-house again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and totally. so, and I, so this oscillating uh, forces, I think are, um, is really good. It's really healthy to go back and forth kind of um, as a career. One thing I want to add too, Grant, you talked about when you're in-house and you go really deep and you get all these relationships across so many different teams at a company um, that does make you a great consultant because Grant and I have talked about sometimes being a MOPS consultant, you're actually a, therapist to your yeah. totally. counterpart as well. Yeah. It's not all about the tech. It's how helping them learn how to position their ask for the SOPS team or the engineering mm -hmm. team, and especially with these big projects like GDPR or analytics and Tableau and things like that, where it really is about getting everyone in the same room and speaking the same language. And that can be really frustrating. And you end up it sounds like you guys have experiences as well, where you're just a therapist being like, it's okay, we'll get through this together. I definitely, yeah, we talk about that a lot. And I think that I, I definitely, I'll, I'll even say that to our team, you know, like you'll, if anyone comes on, I, you know, a big thing that we talk about is empathy. What, you know, what you talked about, because we feel like working in house, working agencies um, that didn't have it, we, that's part of the reason why we wanted to kind of start our own thing because we wanted, I wanted, I thought there was a different way. And I think having that empathy and really understanding, you know, cause a consultant can be like, why is this project taking forever? And it's mm -hmm. like, well, you, if you've worked in house, you know why things might take forever, but then you also can help pivot or give them the message or maybe know where that stop gap is to get that project you know, through and, and the, to the therapy part. And we talk about a lot of these things on, you know, on this podcast and past episodes, but a lot of what makes a great strategic leader in marketing ops is some of those like soft skills, like negotiation and, um, you know, being able to work cross-functionally and communication and being a chameleon and, um, and, you know, some of the people we work with don't have a boss who is maybe giving that or maybe they don't even have that relationship to get that type of mentorship to learn those skills. Or it doesn't come up because all of the time that they're focused on is really like how to make their job better instead of how to basically be better at these skills that will help them do their job better. And yeah, so I think that is a kind of a fun part of the job. I like it a lot. It's one of my favorite parts. Um, but it is, you do end up doing part, you know, therapy or consulting in that way with the person and then part work. So yeah, we definitely experienced that. Totally. So what were the, the big pros and cons of being a consultant that you, you heard from everyone? The pros I think are loud and clear. It's like the work-life balance or living wherever you want, you know, before 
pre-COVID, everyone was like, oh, I want to go independent so I can work from Costa Rica, like granted. Yep. <laughs> Starting to become a little bit more available with the consulting life, but I think it's also the not 40 hours a week with one person where if you do want to go for a hike at noon on a Wednesday, you know, you kind of move your consulting meetings around where need be. Can I, can I ask a question about that though? So one of the things that we've str we've struggled with and had to deal with over the years is because um, the work-life balance was definitely one of the reasons why we we got into it. But what we found <laughs> is that you that's in theory what you could do, but in <laughs> practice you probably don't end up doing that. Because especially since because the more you work, the more you get paid, so you have an incentive to work more. Whereas in house, it doesn't work like that as much maybe you get bonuses or whatever but it's not as linear as just like the more hours I do the more money I get um so there's definitely um a way you need to you need to rein yourself in there um but then also you you always you have the fear you have a bit of fear right that one day you might mm -hmm. not get that new client so you do have to you're always trying to over deliver you're always trying to make sure you're at max capacity or a little bit more you know like how have people talked about that and how even with your own experiences too you'd love to hear it um like how have you dealt with that personally and how have you rationalized that to try and get the the dream of the, that work-life balance that what is why a lot of us start start this you know doesn't exist we're all just <laughs> grinding away no I, right. I i mean we talk about this in terms of pricing i think that's where it comes up it's a mistake to take your full-time role salary divided by number of hours you are sitting at your desk and then say that's your hourly rate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the reason consultants have a high, one of the reasons consultants have a higher rate is that you do want to build in some of that, um, some of that risk factor that you're talking about, Charlie, like you, you, you won't always be working. There will be times when you'll be, trying to find a new client and so you need to like you need to have a little bit of a buffer when you do get paid so when your clients pay you they're not only paying for your specific like task that you're gonna do they're also paying for easing your fear for getting a new client <laughs> <laughs> they're paying to coast you through to the next client as well um mm -hmm. and i think that's important so just knowing that up front like the the ebbs and flows of the projects it's really especially when you're solo it's so like that's the hardest thing is to control the work as it comes in because you'll be like yep. working nights and weekends for one project and then you'll you'll be feeling starved for for next month if you do it wrong courtney it seems to have this like superpower of being able to schedule stuff uh, in advance <laughs> so i don't know you trust you your ways courtney <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I guess I guess it's a superpower. I need to sit down and analyze how I do it so I can explain it better. Um, I tend to, you know, take on probably like three to four clients is my sweet spot at a time and each for, you know, a few days a week here and there. And um, I just try and stay in the best communication possible to know that like this client has a virtual event on this day and this one has their SKO coming up for a big launch um, on certain days and try to keep everyone really abreast of everyone knows I'm only with them part-time. So if I say, hey, to client A, I'm going to be quiet on you for a day or two. Of course, if anything comes up, please let me know, but I'm going to be really focused on client B for this 48-hour window. Um, and Or if I do take a day off here or there, which has actually been possible, um, just being really communicative ahead of time, giving them actually backup contacts as well of you know, if Marketo or Salesforce or something goes down and goes crazy and blows up, they do have someone that they can reach out to while I'm gone. But I also have worked till midnight on a mm -hmm. Tuesday or I've worked on a Saturday. Um, but it does feel different. Grant and I have talked about this. Like if you do it to yourself where you're like, oh, I overcommitted to too much work. I have to get this done before Monday morning. I'm going to work on a Saturday. I don't feel nearly as bitter and jaded as I had in the yep. past when it was my yep. full-time role because it's I did it to myself like mm -hmm. I overcommitted and I will learn and I will scope out the project better next time I'll do more due diligence or you know whatever mm -hmm. yeah and have you um across the people you've interviewed would you say more people are on hourly versus project-based I think yes I think 
predominantly there's a lot of hourly and I am not really hourly. The majority of mine, like 80% of mine are not, they're more project based or monthly retainer based. So I've always found hourly to be, I don't know, icky. That's my professional mm -hmm. <laughs> explanation. It doesn't, you know, motivate me to work any faster. Um, we're kind of just checking boxes and sometimes you work on something for an hour and you're like, this is not the format. I want to build this. I want to completely reverse my matrix report and I want to start over and I don't want to nickel and dime the client for that. And another one is I never want a client to be afraid to invite me to a team meeting or a brainstorming meeting because they're watching the hours for the week. Oh, let's not invite Courtney because she's so expensive. I want to be invited to every meeting. So I want to meet all the stakeholders. So yeah. that's kind of how it's worked for me. So how does your um, retainer model work then? Um, is it just, is that still based on hours or is it, is it kind of a retainer and then you do projects on top of that? Yeah, it's, it is kind of a fuzzy logic and, you know, each client has a little bit of different needs and goals for what they want. So if it's like a three month retainer, I talk about it more in the scope of, well, how many hours is it for that three months? It's the equivalent of 50% of one full-time employee. What would be the OKRs that you would assign for that employee to accomplish for that quarter? And what is 50% of that? What is realistic for someone to be able to deliver in that time frame? Obviously keeping into account other bottlenecks or other stakeholders that might get involved. And so, yes, I'm going to be, you know, paying attention to this client about two days a week or two and a half or whatever the scope is for them. but it's more about the end goal mm -hmm. and doing check-ins, you know, halfway point, have we, are we on track? Does it look like we're making it? And as we get closer and closer to the end of that three month period, making sure that the client is really knows where things land. And if I'm like, we are not going to make this deadline by the end of the month, I don't want to leave them hanging. <clears throat> if mm -hmm. I've committed to getting something done and I have dripped over into the following quarter, you know, on my own time because something didn't get done. Um, or if it gets done earlier, then that's great. You know, they don't have to wait 12 weeks to get something done. If I'm able to get it done in eight weeks. You know. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going more into the, you're selling the, the project and the value, right? And I think value-based pricing is such a, it's a hard concept to get around, to get your head around sometimes, I think, especially in, in, in marketing ops. But I think we, we all have to do a, like, do a better job of setting the value of marketing operations. Like what, what we're doing is impacting the bottom line. It is improving the customer experience. It is have all of these real tangible business outcomes that you can sell your project based on the value of those business outcomes or sell your worth or, or your value if it's in a retainer or whatever model you choose, as opposed to selling time. And there's always that. It's always a battle because the time selling is easy, right? You just go, it's an hour, this is price, I can track it. There you go. The value yeah. conversation is very difficult. And we've we've been working very hard and trying to figure that out as well. But um, I think it's, especially in MOPS, it can be a challenge. Have you have you talked to anyone who is just fully, you know, bought into value-based pricing and they they thought about it really well? Or do you, do you agree it's kind of a bit of a, it's a bit of a middle ground, it's a bit of, bit of a struggle for some people still in marketing ops? I mean, I, I've really uh, tried uh, hard to go value-based pricing uh, a few years ago and failed miserably um, because there was too much barrier to entry, honestly, mm -hmm. because true value-based pricing, you have to understand the problem. You have to interview the client. You, like, you're already so, con like, nobody ever talks to their consultant before they uh, hire the consultant as much as is required for value-based pricing, in my opinion, because you really have to get all the ducks in a row and understand the dynamics within their team mm -hmm. and what value it might deliver. It's really hard to evaluate up front. So, we, we, so what we end up doing for ease of use is just using ours as a currency to discuss the uh, quantity of work that you're going to deliver, essentially. And so... Hours of work to me and to people we talk to don't always mean actual hours of work. They're just a number. And so you have a dynamic of price, a number of hours, and you get to play with them for mm -hmm. different projects. And, and it's okay to experiment. Fewer hours, higher price. Ooh, but we don't, we never hire consultants at, you know, more than $200 an hour. And we really need mm -hmm. you to come down. Okay, I'll come right down, but then I'm, 
going to have more hours. Oh, no problem. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Nobody looks at the hours. The procurement department is looking at the hourly rate. Okay. You know what I mean? It's so silly. What about time? Is this within a month or is this drawn out? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is unpalatable because the project seems too big. Why don't we break it up into 10 pieces over time? Oh, okay. Now nobody notices. So it's really strange how we think about yeah. money. And it really, um, when you start pricing things for yourself, it really makes you come to terms with it. But I, I, especially working with larger corporations, I found it really difficult to have a value-based discussion because mm. they just say, we hire consultants all the time. Name your number. Here's ours. Mm -hmm. You're in the system. Tell us how many hours you spent, you get paid, done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Stop bothering me with this value-based pricing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then finally yeah. I, had to, I had to give up. I had to be like, okay, I guess we're not doing that. I'm, the, the, the industry that we happen to be in doesn't do that. Or maybe at least the projects and the stakeholders I'm talking to don't want to yeah. have that conversation. I'm fully aware. I think there's a few of my clients that know what my retainer fee is and they're doing the math and they're figuring right. out, okay, if it's two and a half days a week, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we were paying for per hour. But again, it's, I'm not tracking it every 15 minute increment and saying, okay, well this week I did 20 hours. So next week I'm going to do less. I do try and think of it for, again, the time frame, like Grant said, over is yeah. it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It, it's a it's a challenging conversation to have because, especially in Moth, because it is so complicated to figure all of these things out and then have that value conversation. I think where we found some success is more using it internally to just value ourselves and value projects instead of thinking. Mm -hmm. So we still, we still in everything we still account for. We mostly do retainer based, but we are doing more projects now, but that we do account for how long it's going to take and we have there's some math mm -hmm. in there around an hourly rate but then we also as part of the you know we, we only do just kind of simple one-page proposals um anyway but we still try to put in there for projects the value that they're going to get out of it yeah so it's mm -hmm. like okay we're doing this thing and the goals are this and you know this is the value you know and this is the price mm -hmm to almost justify the price, mm -hmm. even though there's still some math around hours in it, right? So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much like we're, we bring it up and say, okay, we're going to value price this. And we talk to the client about that. It's more a way to kind of maybe help remove imposter syndrome when you're talking about pricing, help you, you justify the price and help them sell the value of the project internally, because we're tying everything we're doing to you know, increase in revenue or increase in productivity, like real business outcomes. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, we're still learning. It's still, uh, you know, an experience and testing and every client's very different. Yeah. The, I thought the interesting thing you said, it was around the procurement, because I think normally when you're drafting your SOWs or you're doing the selling, you think, oh, I'm only selling this to the person I'm talking to. And then you don't realize, oh, this SOW is going to end up in so mm -hmm. many different hands. My C their CMO might see it like, you know, and so when you're thinking about, okay, what you know that hourly rate to your point yeah you maybe need to also then think about the business size the audience and how you draft that and maybe that does mean make making changes based on um all those different factors and that's a great point because mm -hmm. i think especially if you only work with startups you don't think about procurement they don't have a procurement department you know <laughs> like they, that's right um and so i but got then an email if, from procurement to that she said <laughs> it literally just said can we have a 5% discount? <laughs> Didn't give that's a reason right. why. Or you gotta, that's why you got to build it in so that you can offer it. Um, but one last right. tidbit I'll say is uh, it doesn't, it does, it's still a really great idea to once you're in there and once your project is halfway through or almost done to then tally up the numbers, even though they will not ask you for it. Right. To mm -hmm. surprise them to say, hey, we're 60% there, 80% there here's all the stuff that we've accomplished and here was the value that was delivered. And by the way, I love working with you. That is a great totally. idea to do once you're yeah. in it, but you don't have to do that unnecessarily up front. Right. Right. So I know we're getting towards the end. So maybe we'll, we'll finish it with just some, some of the best advice you have for people. You can either do people moving from in-house going solo or solo to wanting to grow a bit, you know, your choice, but, well, what's some, some of the best advice you can give from what you've learned yourself and from everyone you've interviewed? 
Oh boy, Grant, you go first. I'll go first this time. I'll I'll just say for people who want to go solo, uh, because um, that's what we that's when we've heard of uh, the most from. Um, is my advice would be to moonlight, to give it to practice, to kind of don't uh, just quit your job and kind of go for it. I I feel like we have a mythology about people who do that and are wildly successful, but it's harder than you think, and it will take more time than you think. So my advice to people who are going solo is to just kind of uh, maybe over time, try to build up little project side projects on the side, kind of get the momentum going, get a few practice runs in, sending SOWs and, and, and then charging people and setting up your taxes. And then you, you'll see how that turns into a full-time gig and you'll be solo before you know it. Mm -hmm. And Courtney? Um, I think my advice is to really trust your network. Um, I think we had some conversations where people are like, oh, I don't know yes. where to get clients. And, yes. you know, we've got a network for a reason and it might seem really salesy to reach out to your old demand gen coworker from three jobs ago and tell them, hey, I'm looking for work. But I think if you do it in a genuine place and you're not being greedy or rude, I think it's okay. And mm -hmm. I, if, even if they can't hire you, that's no hard feelings. They might know someone else who could hire you. So, yeah. um, or reach out to grants or I and join the society and listen mm -hmm. to podcasts. And it really, I think as Chrissy said, it's a very welcoming community. There's a lot of work to go around and um, knowing different people that have skills on different platforms has actually been hugely beneficial to me. I am not a Pardot expert by any means or not even necessarily a Salesforce admin. And I'm always looking for people that can help with other tools. So just start putting your name out there, raising your hand. And uh, I think the community will help uplift you. Yeah, nice. that's some great advice. And and I wish I, I wish we had your podcast around when we first started. You know, oh. It's a great resource for everyone to learn from all the people that have done it before right like why maybe why just dive in without learning from people who've been there done that you know learn everything so thank you for whatever you're contributing to the mops consultant community yeah thanks so much courtney and grant and we'll see everyone on the next episode of forward thinking have a good one thanks, thank guys. you this is charlie so if you like what you heard hit like on the platform where you watch this also, leave a review. Honestly, we'd really, really appreciate it. You can also subscribe where you listen to your podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or even YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to our newsletter, which is packed full of exclusive content, updates for events or courses that we might be doing, all designed to elevate your marketing operations and B2B strategy. See you next time on Forward and Forward is Up.